Good morning. Welcome to St. Peter's. Uh, I'm here to do some announcements, then Brandon's going to give you a, a preview of what uh, you're going to experience this morning. Announcements in the life of the church. We started our first uh, class this morning with Jay Rood on the Divine Comedy. It was great. He does his reading, which you'll hear some. Uh, he's, he's our lecturer this morning. So imagine that applied to all of Dante. So join us at 9.45 on Sunday mornings. At 10 o'clock, Brandon led a class in newcomers class. The, final, the third and final one for this round will be next Sunday at 10 o'clock. And you're meeting in the library, right? Yes. So, yeah, meeting in the library. So it's not too late to catch up. Uh, this Wednesday, we will have Tizé starting. Uh, that will be here in, in this, in the nave. And it starts at 6.30 uh, on Wednesday. So join us, it's a wonderful, meditative chance to engage with music uh, and it's wonderful for Lent. So we'll be doing that throughout Lent with a couple of exceptions where we're going to be doing Stations of the Cross. Uh, other announcements at the end of March is the opportunity for the next round of acolyte training. Uh, if you know of someone who would be interested in being an acolyte like Brian or Addy or one of the other uh, folks around here, we would love to have you join us. So that's uh, March 26th. And with that, Brandon, would you like to? So this morning, you're going to notice our liturgy is remarkably different than most Sunday mornings you've probably experienced um, up until this point. Um, we're going to start out with a great litany. And what you're going to notice is um, the altar party is going to process in, and we're going to start circling the nave in kind of like a sideways eight. Uh, the Great Litany actually has an interesting history. Uh, it really came about in the late second uh, century. So these are ancient prayers that have, uh, of course, morphed over time and included uh, more and more um, prayers to God. We, um, we do this once a year and we process at the same time. Uh, the the act of processing um, is actually symbolic. Um, the ancient church believed that in order to quote unquote be a good Christian, um, you needed to do a pilgrimage to Jerusalem once in your lifetime. And so this is symbolically us making our pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So that's why we're doing the figure eight this morning. The other thing that you're gonna notice is that the peace has moved. It is not in the normal spot um, that we've experienced. It is actually in the Eucharistic prayer um, right after we break the bread and we sing the Lamb of God. Then we will share the peace. And part of that is um, our confession and everything is at the beginning of the service. You're going to feel a little bit of that this week and next week um, you'll really feel that when the Great Litany is gone. But we've moved the peace, to, peace um, into the middle of the Eucharist um, at the table um, as a symbolic nature that before we receive the body of Christ, before we break bread with each other, we make peace with each other. So that's why the peace has moved um, to, to the middle of the Eucharist in Lent. So um, just take notes. Uh, let the liturgy wash over you this morning. It is beautiful ancient prayers um, that have been prayed by Christians for uh, thousands um, of years. Thank you.
Please stand as you're able. O oh God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth, Thy 
be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose blessed Son was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan, come quickly to help us who are assaulted by many temptations. And as you know the weakness of each of us, let each one find you mighty to save. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons. reading from Genesis. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden, the garden of Eden, to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for on that day that you eat it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the gardens, but God said, You shall not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired and to make one wise, she took of its, of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. As sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all have sinned, sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one who, has, who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died through one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the effect of the one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass through condemnation but the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If because of the one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to the condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. After Jesus was baptized, he was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, 
It is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And the devil left him, and suddenly the angels came and waited on him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. This is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. At Ash Wednesday service, Brandon spoke about the changing geography of the scripture that we're experiencing. From last Sunday's mountaintop experience to today's journey into the wilderness, we're certainly seeing a shift in the topography of the word, if you will. But the above quote from the final verse in Matthew 3 refers to another piece of geography, the Jordan River, the site of Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist. The final words from God seem to echo throughout today's reading. This is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. Now you think about it, that should be the definitive identifier of who this person Jesus is. Yet the question of Jesus' identity hovers over the entire Gospel of Matthew. Folks in the Gospel constantly wonder just who this Jesus person is. The disciples on the storm-tossed boat say, what sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? John's letter from prison, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? The words of Judas' betrayal, the one I will kiss is the man, arrest him. And even the taunts from the people as Jesus is dying on the cross, if you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Well, there's certainly a lot of space covered in the search for Jesus' true identity. And one would think again that God's opening words in Matthew 3 would have been enough. This is my son, the beloved in whom I am well pleased. But of course they're not. And the devil in the wilderness knows all this, this all too well. The opening move of the tempter's gambit of deception traffics in the very question of Jesus' identity. If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Now we've come to know these verses as the three temptations of Jesus. Some prefer to think of it as a single temptation with three variations. And this overarching or uber temptation all revolves around power. It's a time-tested trick. I mean, even in the garden in today's reading from Genesis, we hear Eve being tempted by power. The serpent says, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Power, or the illusion of power, and its cousin, control, are at the center of all temptation. And the first variation on this temptation on power might be called something like the temptation to attempt the miraculous. The devil cleverly opens with what might be seen as concern for the 40-day famished Jesus, 
command these stones to become loaves of bread. The devil wants Jesus to command a new reality, one where stones become bread. Maybe because the old reality, the one created by God and called good is no longer, well, no longer good enough. And I imagine this temptation might sound almost feasible to Jesus following his 40 days fast in the wilderness. But if he were to act upon it, might this little slip, this little slip to overcome an immediate inconvenience yield larger unforeseen consequences? I mean, keep in mind that Adam's bite of the fruit in the garden carried enormous consequences for all humanity. And I wonder how often do we wish for God to perform a miracle to allow us to overcome an immediate inconvenience when the inconvenience might be what we most need. It's Easter without Good Friday. The miraculous robs us of the basic goodness of God's creation. Now Jesus' second variation on the temptation, or the devil's second variation on the temptation of Jesus, the temptation to power might be called the temptation to the spectacle. The devil wants Jesus to force God's hand, to intervene in a self-inflicted test, to confirm that Jesus truly is the Son of God. As you know, we've been living in a celebrity-soaked culture for several decades now. We elevate our tech leaders, our gazillionaires, our media anointed. Some even want to make Jesus the uber celebrity, rising above all the others. But as Jesus says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Don't make it about you or anyone. Just make it about God. And the final variation on the temptation is probably the most obvious. The temptation to political power. The devil offers all the kingdoms of the world in exchange for Jesus' worship. Of course, it begs the question of whether they're the devils to give, but no mind here. See, in this third variation, it seems the devil's kind of running out of options. The temptation to earthly power is the most overt and is exactly what we'd expect the devil to do. He doesn't even question Jesus' identity this time like he did the other two. He doesn't open with, if you are the son of God. It's the devil in his least creative, in his most spot on power play. Which isn't to say that it's not very tempting. The story of Christendom from Constantine on has been one of trying to exert worldly power, if not in the name of Jesus, then in the name of the religion, Christianity. And even today, folks in power, or those wanting to be in power, are quick to evoke Jesus' name in that effort. Citing the power of love, it forgets Jesus on the cross, the greatest act of weakness and of love, and yearns for a warrior messiah, ready to battle anyone who disagrees. But Paul's second letter to the Corinthians confirms in us Whenever I am weak, then I am strong. You see, Jesus joins us in weakness. As much as we'd like him to be all powerful out there in the world, he meets us instead where we are. And that's a good thing. But instead, we want to skip over that frustrating but telling detail of Jesus' life, hanging on the cross in great agony on Good Friday. This is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. God's testament to the identity of Jesus should be enough, but it's not. The whole of the gospel speaks to that. The entire project of Christianity has turned on that troubling fact. Now, as we talked about in our annual meeting in January, Brandon and I are trying to elevate our appreciation and understanding of the importance of our baptism in our lives of faith. It is truly the pivotal, pivotal act upon which our faith can flourish. It is a rite of initiation that is filled with archetype and imagery, death and resurrection in the waters of the baptism. In our catechism, at the end of the, at the last page of the Book of Common Prayer, baptism is defined as 
the sacrament by which God adopts us as his children and makes us members of Christ's body. God adopts us as his children. So God's statement of Jesus' identity, this is my son, the beloved in whom I am well pleased, this statement, this pledge, this affirmation, it becomes ours as well in our baptism. This is my son, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. This is my daughter, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. We're united to Christ in our baptism as it echoes Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River. We heard in Matthew 3. See, we too share identities as children of God, created by God and called good, rejoined to Christ in our baptism. And just as we saw in Jesus' temptation, after his baptism in this morning's gospel, the devil is constantly trying us, trying to get us to forget our identities, who we are. Now we may not share the same exact temptations that Jesus experienced, but the tempter is always trying to get us to doubt who we truly are, what we're made for. When we're overwhelmed by insecurity about not having enough, or not being enough, or not looking a certain way, it's a temptation. When we make judgments about strangers despite our ignorance, that's a temptation. When we're able to look away from those in need at the street, uh, at the street corner or in the parking lot, temptation. When we allow our anger or temple, our temper to rule our lives, temptation. When our addictions to wealth or power or even control also rule our lives, temptation. When we're so caught up in the trappings of our life that we lose sight of life itself, temptation. You see, our temptations are still all about power in one way, shape, or form. It's, it is the devil's favorite tool. It's just power disguised maybe as pride or vanity or selfishness. On the other hand, maybe as apathy or distraction and forgetfulness. All are ways we forget our true identity, our true selves, as beloved by God, in whom he is well pleased. Now, we generally don't share Jesus' ability to overcome our temptations. So we slip, we fall and then we repent, and that's why we have Lent. It's a time to engage the dark places in our lives, to come to them face to face, to name them, to understand them, and to ask for forgiveness. And this is not about guilt, that's too easy. It's about getting the freedom from control that our fears and insecurities have over each one of us. It's freedom from control that our fears and insecurities have over us. See, in those temptations and our reactions to them, we are forgetting our true identities as children of God called good, as adopted by God into the body of Christ, God's beloved in whom he's well pleased. Now, I've said before that Lent is the most countercultural time of the year or maybe counterintuitive. It's, it's when our penitence and darkness are supposed to coexist with the blooming daffodils and dogwoods and flowering magnolias of springtime. When darkness fights with the green shoots of a returning spring. And each week it gets a little bit tougher and spring's abundance becomes more and more overwhelming. But today, this morning, this first Sunday in Lent, Let's take the chance to remember our true selves as God sees us. Let's practice shedding our skins to times in the past and the present when we forgot our true identity. And let's cry out deeply for forgiveness, redemption, and absolution as in the waters of baptism. So let's use this Lent, these 40 days, to practice remembering and more importantly, being who we truly are and were made to be, God's beloved in whom he's well pleased. Amen.
Standing as you're able, let us affirm our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternally begotten of the Father. In peace we pray to you, Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love and be found without fault at the day of your coming, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Michael, our presiding bishop, for Larry, our own bishop, for all bishops and other ministers, and for all the holy people of God, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who shall choose a bishop for this diocese, that we may receive a faithful pastor who will care for your people and equip us for our ministries, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who take counsel in the Standing Committee, the Bishop Search Committee, and the Transition Committee, that they may in all things seek first your honor and glory. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who fear God and believe in you, Lord Christ, that our divisions may cease and that all may be one as you and the Father are one. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. We pray to you, O Lord, for the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among the nations and peoples. We pray to you, O Lord, for those in positions of public trust, especially Joseph, our president, and Sarah, our governor, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a blessing upon all human labor, and for the right use of the riches of creation, that the world may be freed from poverty, famine, and disaster, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer, for refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger, 
that they may be relieved and protected. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this congregation, for those who are present and for those who are absent, that we may be delivered from hardness of heart and show forth your glory in all that we do. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our enemies and those who wish us harm, and for all whom we have injured or offended, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have commended themselves to our prayers, especially Trillery, Brittany, David, Robin, Cherry, Amy, Ian, Sheree, Lori, Tim, Angela, Andy, Carla, Chuck, Warren, Sarah, Betty, Carol Sue, Eleanor, Shannon, Anissa, and the Wisdom House, Moaz, Natalie, Mumina, Kansa, Rasha, and all those impacted by the conflict in Syria. Are there other petitions? For our families, friends, and neighbors, that being freed from anxiety, they may live in joy, peace, and health, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those whose lives are closely linked with ours, especially for our worship and music ministries, and for Cody, our seminarian, and thanksgiving for the Hillel Association at Hendricks, for the Second Baptist Church, Thanks for the Thanksgiving for the Right Reverend Silvestre Romero Leon, Suffragan Bishop of Western Guatemala. We give thanks for St. Albans in Stuttgart and St. Peter's in Tollville and all Episcopal Day Schools. Are there other Thanksgivings? We pray to you, O Lord. Lord. For all who have died in the community of your church, especially Lily and Rod, are there others? And those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have Rejoicing in the fellowship of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, Blessed Peter and all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To you, o Lord. For yours is the majesty, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. May be seated. Here in just a moment, we will be celebrating the Holy Eucharist. Here at St. Peter's, all are welcomed at this table, no matter where you are in your journey of faith. Um, if you wish to receive, uh, you'll come up at the urging of the ushers. Um, you can kneel or stand at the al altar rail. Um, extend your hand out and we'll place a uh, wafer into your hand um, and we do have gluten-free wafers if you wish to receive the wine when it comes by you can either drink directly from the chalice or you can intaint and you can dip the wafer in um, or you can just do one or the other totally up to you all of its Jesus um, if you wish to just receive a blessing, just come up and cross your arms over your chest and Greg um, or I will be happy to, to give you a blessing. What I ask of you is this, my family. If you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gifts.
We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him, you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him, you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death and into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death we proclaim his resurrection, and we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be made acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with St. Peter and all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. 
And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. gifts of God and for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Please stand as you're able. Beth, in the name of this congregation, we send you forth bearing these holy gifts, that those to whom you go may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We, who are many, are one body, because we share one bread, one cup. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bow down before the Lord. Grant, most merciful Lord, to your faithful people pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve you with a quiet mind through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm.